Anybody hear that? I'm fairly alarmed here. Come on, come on, come on. We gotta get out of here. We gotta get out of here. Now, now, right now. We're not brothers. It's time. And welcome back. To the Knights of Christendom, standing for Western Civilization, Holy Mother Church, and our King Jesus Christ in the face of a godless liberty. Tonight, we're putting on our tinfoil hats as we're talking about Catholic conspiracy, the Alta Vendita, that infamous document that now seems to be, well, seems to be coming to fruition here <laughs> about 150 years after the fact. Neil, my friend, the Alta Vendita is a document that many of us Catholics have been talking about for a long time. We're in the midst of maybe the greatest crisis in the history of the church, my friend. For those of our audience out there who have never heard of the Alta Vendita or maybe just need some more information, where do we start to explain this to our audience, Neil? Well, you know, the thing is, uh, anyone can look it up, but if you don't want to do that, what it basically is is that it's a secret document written in the early 19th century that mapped out a blueprint for the subversion of the Catholic Church. Uh, it's basically a change of tactics for the Freemasons and how they're going to infiltrate and attack the church. And it came from one of the, the highest lodge in uh, Italy. And once again, a Freemasonry lodge. And it was condemned by the Catholic Church. Now, eventually this document was discovered in the Italian by, uh, well, I don't know who discovered it, but I know who published it, Pope Pius IX in 1859, as well as Pope Leo as well, who uh, had it published. So that's how it became known and put out there into the, the public mind. But quite simply, it's the Freemasons not just declaring they're going to attack the church, but rather changing how they're going to attack the church. Because as it, anyone who reads it will see, they mention that they already have been trying to attack the church, that the church is a problem, that they need to get rid of it. But rather... They're changing from, instead of using force of arms, like they did in the, the terror, they're now going to infiltrate and subvert and do so over centuries, if it, if it takes that long. And I hate to say it, it, when you read through it, it really feels like that is exactly what is happening today. Yes, it's very interesting. Uh, the Ottoman Dita was a name of the Carbonari Lodge in Italy, right there, right close to Rome itself. Uh, the document, like you said, Neil, was discovered by Pope Pius IX, who was a very fascinating kind of a guy to start off with. And I think where I like to go with this, Neil, is just kind of get a little bit of the background, the historical narrative here, because this document really comes to full fruition after the French Revolution. And in many ways, the French Revolution, because it failed, in its attempt to murder Catholics out of extinction, I guess you could say, because that's what it was trying to do at that time. Uh, the French Revolution failed. And what the um, the Masons figured out is, listen, you know, these pesky Catholics, we can murder as many as we want, but all they do is take their martyrs and turn them into saints. And they build altars yeah. and churches and they erect monuments and, and devotions. I mean, the more Catholics we kill the stronger they actually become. And it's one of the things that the, that the Masons actually talk about early on. And so that's when this kind of, you know, to switch the strategy was, okay, let's not kill them off. We can't destroy them from the outside. I mean, Lord knows, hey, uh, you know, the Romans try to do it. The Protestants try to do it. I mean, so many outside forces tried to destroy the church throughout history. The Masons early on figured out that this is not going to happen on the outside. But let's embed ourselves on the inside. Let's pretend we're Catholics and slowly begin to kind of change teachings from within. And, and it comes really at a period of time, Neil, where you got these 19th century revolutions happening all over the world. And the 19th century 
It's fascinating because you see Freemasonic influence all over the globe, starting with a lot of the unifications of a lot of different nations, particularly Italy in itself, and how the Masons started with Garibaldi, who starts at, in the south at the southern tip of Sicily and works his way up to force unification. The Pope in that respect, which was Pope Pius IX, again, is surrounded by sort of the Freemasonic revolutions of that time and is forced to flee and hide and ultimately is trapped in the Vatican, I believe, for a number of years. It was a fascinating time. But in essence, the French Revolution failed, Neil. And the Masons figured out that they had to go undercover. And this is what we begin to see in the 19th century. And in my opinion, it goes a lot further than just the infiltration of the church. Because as we see today, Masonic ideas have now dominated, or at least dominate every institution in the globe today. And so, listen, we're going to talk about the Catholic perspective on this, Neil, but let's not kid ourselves. The Masonic influence touches everybody across the globe, not just Catholics, my friend. Yeah, you can see it even in uh, the architecture of the United States, you know, especially in Washington. They, they love their symbols, the Freemasons. And that symbolism is all over uh, different parts of the country. And you just have to have an eye for it. The more you learn about the Freemasons, the more you see it just everywhere, especially, like I said, in the architecture. But also, whenever you start to hear people talk of separation of church and state, when you hear people say, well, heck, you do your thing, I'll do my thing, you know, and so let's not force our beliefs on anybody else. That, all that kind of talk, that is Freemason principles. And it is so infiltrated, influenced the culture and governments, not just the church, that even when I say those things just now, I'm sure there are a number of people who go, well, what's wrong with that? Which just goes to show, to show you it is so a part of the culture that no one thinks, wait a minute. Uh, the social kingdom of Jesus Christ. The truth is Jesus Christ. And no, you don't have a right to be wrong. You don't have a right to push false, uh, erroneous ideas. So it's everywhere. You can just, if you just have an eye for it and a mind for it, you will see it everywhere. And if you read the Alta Vendita, you will definitely see enlightenment thinking. And you'll pick up on it more when you look at uh, the... Even the founders, I hate to keep bringing up the founders. I'm not trying to hate on the founders. I'm just pointing out that it even infiltrated some of their thinking and their talk in the way they spoke and the way they thought and their principles. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, the Masons, um, they masked a lot of their ideas under the concepts of human dignity, human solidarity, and religious freedom. Like you mentioned, Neil, religious liberty in itself is a Masonic concept where everybody can hold to sort of their own personal moral code or their own personal religious belief, but as a society as a whole, we don't impugn sort of any bigger principles, only those within that are held within the sort of the, the tenets of our own being, I guess. That's the kind of concepts they um they private sort of beliefs. Yeah, private and, and really that goes contrary to the Catholic Church in many ways, which is a publicly declared faith and always was from its origin. That's why so many of the early Christians died early on, because they wouldn't deny their faith publicly. And so and like you said, listen. In his 1974 book, Athanasius and the Church of Our Time, Bishop Rudolf Graeber said, quote, The goal is no longer the destruction of the church, but to make use of it by infiltrating it. And this was about getting into the seminaries, getting into the, you know, into the schools of thoughts and, and sort of ingraining these ideas of sort of indifference and, and liberty into the mind. So not only are, are they Masonic ideas, but in, in an attempt to make them look like Catholic ideas. And I was listening to John Veneri um, yesterday, Neil, he talked about Archbishop Lefebvre, who before he went into the actual seminaries in France, he actually thought that the idea of separation and uh, separation of church and state was a good idea until he went into the seminaries and got some really high quality teaching from some traditionalist bishops who said, no, 
Separation of church and state is a heresy. And of course, we all know here at the Knights of Christendom that separation of church and state is what has really begun to unravel Western civilization at this point in time. Because as I've argued so many times, and you've argued on this show, Neil, the fact that Western governments or these liberal Western governments in post-Enlightenment civilization now have no more moral arbiter truth at the top, that it's the, sort of the will of a fallen people that dictates morality. We've seen that trickle down into civilization at this point in time, and we see that Masonic concepts really begin to collapse sort of within this moral quandary where there is no more moral truth. It's all private faith. It's all private religion. It's all private moral codes, Neil. And look at the world we've created. Yeah, and you know, see, whenever you see the rise of relativism, subjectivism, modernity, you know, modernism, when you see moral decay, when you see chaos, when you see the, the idea that, well, your religion is, is private, it doesn't need to be public, the idea that we don't talk about politics and we don't talk about religion. When you see all of that, understand what you're seeing is Masonic principles in action. And we have this tendency to make it to, to think that, well, no, this is just good common sense. You know, we don't want to cause any problems and we want to let everyone do what they want to do. But in reality, it is straight Masonic infiltration. I mean, when we talk about infiltration, and people think, well, that's conspiracy talk. Well, we're not necessarily meaning a specific person is a card-carrying Mason. Now, those those guy people do exist. But more importantly, what, what we're hitting on is the infiltration of these ideas in principles that are corrupting the, the truth that the church teaches. And, you know, you mentioned uh, infiltrating seminaries. I can attest to that. There are people who are constantly, when you bring up masonry, they are very sympathetic to the masons. They want to bring up all the good things about them. I mean, I don't know about other parts of the country, but here in Louisiana, we have parades, you know, like Mardi Gras and everything else. And we have the Shriners who ride in the parades. And they are associated with Shriners Hospital, uh, Good Deeds, Fraternity, this kind of stuff. No one knows or at least it didn't seem like they know, the evil that is at the core of the beliefs and principles of these people. And it's doctrines like the Alta Vendita that need to be out there. They need the light shown. They need, it needs to be on the news. It needs to be publicized. But what has happened is it's made to look like conspiracy theory. So, of course, we all look like weirdos. So, I mean, that's, that's what you got. You know, you're going to get persecuted. Well, you know, I think the problem there with labeling just a conspiracy theory and moving on is the fact that we have so much evidence that all this is taking place. That's why it doesn't work with me. As yeah. soon as Pope Leo the Thirteenth is in power, he came. He comes out and says that quote: "We must tear the mask off Freemasonry." So Pope Pius the Ninth discovers it. His successor, Pope Leo the Thirteenth, really doubles down on it and makes a lot of these this document public. And what is interesting about that to me is, is that Pope Leo the Thirteenth actually paid for it out of his own money to have the document translated into Italian because he wanted the document to be out there. Listen, I heard this a while back, but in the 1800s, there is no other issue that the popes formally wrote about more than Freemasonry. I think 18 times in the 1800s alone, Freemasonry was condemned by the popes throughout that one century right there, which shows you how seriously they took it. Let me tell you here what the problem is. Now. I'm going to tell you right it now what the problem is. It is still condemned. You're right. But they really took initiative in the 19th century, in the 1800s. But let's get down to the brass balls here, okay, about this conspiracy. And, and let me tell you why. The problem is this, specifically in America, but really all other nations, is that there is a link between Freemasonry and all these liberal Western governments at this point in time, particularly in America, as the Founding Fathers had a deep link to Freemasonry, which causes all kinds of problems and contradictions, I guess you could say. This is why in America, Neil, Freemasonry has always come off as this kind of 
you know, boys club. It's a men's club. It's a social club. It's Shriners and they're out doing good deeds. But in Europe, you go to Europe, Freemasonry is not seen as a men's social club. It's seen as a religion. See, th th that's a very basic fundamental point that we need to acknowledge because the intricate sort of relation that Freemasonry has to America really allows Americans to distance themselves and really go on that conspiracy kind of bender in order to just, just to explain this away. Because if we get into the sort of argumentation that America is a Freemasonic nation from its origin, don't get me wrong, it's Protestant as well too. I believe sort of Protestantism and Calvinism at that time and, and the strange Protestant sects at the founding of America sort of infused itself with a lot of Freemasonic principles and sort of became sort of these unspoken allies. I think there's a problem there, Neil, that Americans never want to address. And so simply saying, hey, that's conspiracy. You're a bunch of kooks there. That's why we see this dismissal of it. Yeah, because it's like a, a self-defense mechanism. Because if masonry is condemned, then they have to admit that there is masonry uh, infiltration. And then they have to admit that some of their ideas are wrong because they're founded in Masonic principles. So, yeah, they have to uh, avoid the condemnation. And one of the ways to do this is to write it off as a simple conspiracy theory. And, you know, one of the things that also that, that goes against the whole it's a just a conspiracy is that Pope Pius IX guaranteed the authenticity of the document. I mean, that's, that's, that's putting, talk about putting your neck out. This is a world leader, you know, uh, and head of the church who is personally saying, no, this is authentic and guaranteeing that authenticity. So uh, it, you're really, the, the real conspiracy is when you try to deny it, the reality of it. Yeah, and I think what's funny to me is he's guaranteeing the authenticity of it while he's being attacked by Freemasons in Italy at the same time. That's the irony of it. This is the Pope that was forced to flee in the midst of the 1948 revolutions that broke out in Italy and broke out in Germany at the same time. All of those which were Freemasonically inspired, ironically enough. So Pope yeah. Pius IX had a lot, of, a lot of insight into what was going on. This dismissive notion that, oh, it's just a conspiracy theory. This was a Pope and a man that was forced to flee for his life from the Masons yeah. who were trying to really bring about the revolutionary spirit that was started in, in France 50, 60, 70 years earlier into the rest of Europe. We have to keep that in mind. And so, you know, listen... Uh, Freemasonry, or should I say the Alta Vendita, they promote the general concepts of liberty, as we talked about, which is, you know, Neil, you can say what you want, print anything you want, and generally, as long as you don't step on your neighbor's toes, everything is all good. We see that in modern times, sort of in constitutional republics spread throughout the West. Uh, you could have your own private religious belief of but politics and science is where real truth now lies. Religions and all these new political ideas needed to be kept a secret. And now man, rather than God, was the center of this new ideological belief system based on Freemasonry. Hey, Neil, Jesus Christ can be honored privately, but he has no place in the middle of society like he once did 1,200 years prior to the Masonic revolutions, my friend. Yeah, you know, if you become a Mason... You can believe in Jesus or Satan equally. It doesn't matter to them. You can honor whatever God or false God you want. And isn't that basically the same line of don't force your beliefs on me, but you can believe whatever you want? Isn't that the same exact thing as saying freedom of religion, freedom of religion? It's the same demonic thing because it places error on the same pedestal, makes it equal to truth. It makes Satan equal to Jesus. It makes false gods equal to Jesus. And that in and of itself is such a grave demonic error because one of the reasons it's so bad is because it's subtle. It's so It sounds so good. It's so seductive to say, yeah, yeah, everyone should just have their own freedom and do what they want. Who's against freedom? Nobody's against freedom. You know, but in saying that, then there is no real true freedom at that point. There's no truth. So you've denied Christ. You've denied the gospel. Freedom from sin. Freedom from bondage to, uh, and slavery to sin. Well, 
doesn't matter all of a sudden. It's all just whatever you want it to be. And I know another thing to point out too is that one of the quotes I have for the Ultimate Dino, it mentions the enfranchisement of the entire world. So it's not just relegated to one lodge or one place on the planet. They're talking about the entire, they want the church destroyed everywhere, not just Italy or Rome. And on top of that, they also use the language of the fraternal republic and the harmony of humanity. How many freaking times do we hear that kind of language? One, the fraternal republic, I, re I, I really hear that in the United States with the we are a republic, you know, and brotherhood and this kind of thing. But the second part, the harmony of humanity. I hear that so much even in the church with this whole tolerance as the highest virtue kind of yeah. mentality. And it's sickening. And I'm going, you, you, you sound like a mason, which is exactly what the ultimate Dita said it wanted to do. It wasn't trying to argue people into their camp. They didn't want to win people over through a kind of evangelization. They just wanted to so corrupt and infiltrate on a principle level, on a teaching level, that the clerics would naturally have this belief inside of them. So it would grow organically mm -hmm. as opposed to being talked into this. And look what we have today. La-di-da. Well, I mean, we have pagan idols in, in the Vatican. You know, it's like yeah. it's the fulfillment of their plan. Well, Neil, this is what I would add, though, you know, because while we talk about this as a grand conspiracy within the Catholic Church, many of our friends on the outside, particularly the classical liberals, will say, well, nah, those are Catholic internal problems. You guys, I don't I don't have to worry about that. Oh, really? You guys don't have nothing to worry about. Um, there, there was an article. I know there was an article I read from a couple years back. Somebody posted up on Facebook and how something like out of something like. Out of every 12 college professors, 11 of them are extreme left-wing progressives. And this goes back to my point that I said earlier. This is just one example of how all the institutions have been hijacked by Freemasonry over the past, really, 250 years. Now, see, here's the difference how the where we kind of get this um, false notion and ideologies and principles that get all screwed up. Because the classical liberals are caught in this false sort of paradigm of this left and right debate, what they will say is, no, 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 those are liberals, those are progressives, those are Democrats that are in the institution that have taken them over. No, stop right there. The left and right paradigm is false, once again, because what the progressives have done is simply taken sort of the, the principles of Freemasonry and taken them to their most illogical conclusion. When we see all these major institutions in the West, like educational systems, governments, Hollywood, the music industry, I mean, go down the list. These are not being hijacked simply by leftists in this sort of, you know, 21st century left and right debate that is a false narrative. These are Masonic principles. These are Freemasons that have taken over these principles. They may not use the term Freemason. They may not call themselves or identify themselves as Freemasons. But, Neil, when we see the left and right divide, and as I keep telling you, even in America, we've been going to the far left since 1776 with all the major institutions of this country alone being hijacked by the progressives. I think we got to stop using this word left and right, left and right. These are Masonic institutions, or should I say, these are institutions that have been hijacked by Masons and our friends on the classical liberal side don't even know what battlefield they fight on anymore, my friend. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of that, too, has to do with the fact that the core beliefs of masonry are not really outlined a lot of times for public consumption. And, I mean, I wish I could just have a bullet point of this is what they believe. Keep an eye on other people when you hear them talk. When you hear these politicians start to talk, recognize, oh, look, there they are, once again, doing the whole, you know, truth is relative thing. Oh, look. There's the separation of church and state thing. And it, as long as people can summarize their beliefs and have it kind of memorized as to what a Masonic belief system is, then it's easier to unmask these, quote unquote, angels of light, you know, because they, they want to come across doing so many good things. But in actuality, they're, they're hiding like Satan is an angel of light. They're just... 
it's it's disgusting. It's and it's frustrating too because every time you think you you can point something out, someone's there to quickly try to make it something else and water it down, make it sound nice and acceptable. And aren't you oh, you being intolerant? And why are you chasing these conspiracies? And it it, it just gets ridiculous after a while. So you want you want to slap people in the face and just don't wake up. Yeah, yeah, and you see the full fruition of this really go throughout the late 1800s into the early 1900s. Uh, by the time sort of the Marxist revolution happens in Russia, which again was a Freemasonic-led uh, revolution there as well too, as they really, we really um, intimated a lot of the same principles of the French Revolution, but we know that was Freemasonically inspired. Belladad testifies to Congress here in America how, you know, all these Marxist priests or communist priests, 1,200, I believe is the number she gave, were sort of sort of secretly, you know, put into the Catholic Church by the Masons at that point. And then we begin to see all the scandals in the church in the second half of the 20th century. By the time the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, Vatican II, we, you got the pedophilia scandal rocking the church now, and really the whole world. Listen, when we talk about, you know, the, the, the Catholic Church and the pedophilia scandal, the whole world is rocked by sort of sexual immorality at this point in time. So we just highlight the church because we here hold our own accountable at the Knights of Christendom, which is our own church. But the point being is, is that we see Freemasonry. And I, I don't believe there's no irony that it begins at the French Revolution with, you know, a naked lady liberty uh, <laughs> leading the charge as a symbol of cause for the Masons. And here we are in the 21st century now, and the sexual perversion is all over the world. And quite frankly, Neil, Our Lady warned us that at this point in history, that all the institutions of the world will be dominated and controlled by the Freemasonic sex, my friend. Well, Lex Arendi, Lex Credendi, Lex Aventi. So how you pray is how you believe is how you live. And so here are the Masons. Um, allow me to speculate just a little bit here, okay? That is it possible that the Masons were very happy to infiltrate Vatican II and affect the way the church prays in order to affect how she believes and then in turn how she lives. Um, and you'll notice after all those things is when we start discovering all this moral corruption, which is the modus operandi of the uh, Masons is corrupt morality, corrupt their morals. That's how we'll win, you know, is their idea. So when it, that's another sign of Masonic workings is the way in which we approach prayer, the way in which our... Our leaders talk about prayer, and that is directly going to affect how and what they believe. And I, I put it this way, another good way to go about it is when you when you meet a priest or a bishop or anybody, really, and you want to know, gee, is this person on the level? Well, look at how they pray. And if their way of praying is very wishy-washy, uh, they reject suffering and the cross, hardships, and it's all it's all lovey-dovey stuff, right? Then you have at least a, a warning sign that, well, gee, now I can look at what do they believe. And I guarantee if their prayer's off, you're going to find out they believe the wrong things, and you're going to see they live the wrong way. And where the church goes, so goes the rest of the world. That's right. So when you see, when you see all these things happening in the culture and in the world, well, that is another symptom of the fact that the church has lost her way. And when we say the church, we're not talking about the mystical body, but rather the hierarchical body of the church, because the mystical body is perfect. Um, we can't, you know, we, we want to make sure we have a distinction, a distinction between those two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I say that so many times before. When the Catholic Church is healthy, the civilization is healthy. When the Catholic Church is sick, civilization is sick. And I think the... Sort of, you know, as we've heard by many of the pundits, and I believe it was Michael Davis who said that the Second Vatican Council was a French revolution of the Catholic Church. I could be wrong on that, but I, I know one of the high-ranking Catholics in the past, or at least one of the, the the big philosophical thinkers, had said that. And it's, you know, it's no wonder that starting in 19, really 1961, where the pill is made over the counter, let's remember, John... 
the 23rd, was supposed to unveil the third secret of Fatima to the world in 1960. According to a few testimonies, including Malachi Martin, when he went to open the envelope in 1960, he opened it, he looked at it, he said, this is not for my pontificate. He put it back in the envelope and went back into the Vatican safe. And it was at that moment we had a pope that you could possibly argue, I'm, I'm, I'm just you know, a little bit speculating here, that might have disobeyed the mother of God from how history has been told to me. The next year, uh, contraception was made over the counter. A few years later, it's abortion, pornography, homosexuality, transgender. All of the moral crisis really ensues after 1960, after John the 23rd refused to address it, and the Second Vatican Council ensues. And this is also when we begin to see the really the loss of faith by Catholics. We see Protestants begin to prey on Catholics who no longer uh, know their faith because they've been poorly catechized and all these sort of wishy-washy Protestant groups, like you said, with poor prayer concepts, really begin to take a foothold, at least in this culture here. See, what's interesting to me is, is while um, wishy-washy fake Christianity takes a foothold under the guise of religious liberty in America, Europe begins to completely apostatize and, and, and atheism becomes sort of the wave in Europe. The way America and Europe reacted in that time was very different. Um, and, and that's fascinating in itself. But the ultimate point here is, Neil, is that as we, we begin to wrap up this podcast, is that the Masons had really sunk their claws deep into sort of the the, the, the deepest elements of the church and by the time the 1960s and 70s come around, we begin to see the function of the church and many of the practices be altered and watered down. And with that, the faith really begins to diminish uh, within the laity. And the apostasy really now is on really light speed at this point in time. It's just amazing to me in my lifetime, Neil, how rapidly the apostasy has sort of taken a foothold uh, I was a kid, you know, raised in the late 70s and really uh, throughout most of the 80s, remember celebrating the faith with my very devout Sicilian family who came from the island. And in just 30, 40 years of my lifetime, I've seen nothing but uh, but really the outright eradication of the faith to, to such a degree that me and my wife always kind of joke to each other saying, oh boy, man, how come we don't know anybody else that believes the things that we believe in? And I'm not saying that in a way that makes me better, Neil. I'm not saying that. What I'm just saying to you is nobody believes in the faith anymore. Uh, or should I say very yeah. few people at this point in time. So, um, Yeah, no one takes it serious. No, no. The, the, faith, the faith is something you do on Sunday. The faith is uh, maybe a potluck at the, uh, at the center of church, maybe. Uh, it's a donation on Sunday. It's mass. That's about it. I mean, it's like they they have this so limited view of the faith. They're not necessarily all evil people, but it's it's this blindness of I should say it's a it's a they they draw this distinction between well this stuff is real life, and then there's the faith, as if somehow they're separate, as if somehow I can have these two different things where this is just playtime. My faith is just playtime, really. It's it's shallow in a sense. It's it's abstract. It's not practical to me. And then there's my real life where I gotta go to work and handle this and that. When the two are meant to be joined together, faith and reason, all right? You know, faith and works. They're supposed to be united. And that's the thing that it's so hard to find like minded people over. And it's not about sheltering either and in in not uh, in a, in somehow avoiding the world. I mean, think of this like a military thing. No, this is about rallying my forces. This is about having a headquarters to retreat to where it's safe and I can, I can train. I can uh, rest and strengthen myself so that when I go out into the world, I'm ready for it. You know, and this got a little bit off topic, but it's, it's, it is kind of related to, but Someone uh, made a comment about how how I'm trying we're trying to homeschool the kids, and it made this idea. Well, so many homeschool people try to shelter their kids, and how we're how are they supposed to be ready for the world if we're gonna not let them see the world? That kind of thing. Well, it's not sheltering; it's preparing. How do you prepare? You don't throw them into the deep end and say, "Well, you better learn to swim 
So when you go out in the real world, you're prepared for it. No, you build them up on a foundation. And it's the same thing for adults, though. We, have, we need a foundation. We need a base camp of like-minded believers who we can pray with. Imagine that, Catholics praying with each other outside of Mass. I mean, I, I find most Catholics I run into get very uncomfortable when you talk about praying with them. Uh, how about studying Scripture, you know, Catholic Scripture, not just mix, ha, mixed bag of somewhat Protestant, somewhat Catholic kind of stuff. It's like you, you don't find it anywhere. You can't find any communities anywhere. And the people you do meet, well, one's in Louisiana, one's in Texas, one's in uh, Salt Lake City. You know, it's like, yeah. It's spread out, you know? Well, Neil, I'll say this much to you, okay? For all the dismissals we get of sort of the Catholic conspiracy about the Freemasons, the only thing you really have to look at is the correlation between the rise of of democracy and Freemasonic concepts and really the great apostasy that has ensued ever since really the, the French Revolution or the revolutions of the Masons in the late, what, 18th century. Uh, the, the fact is that for 1,200 years or really 1,600 years under the governance of Holy Mother Church, the faith resided in people. It was strong. Family stayed together. Civilization made sense. Was it a perfect world? Of course not, because man's nature is fallen. But never in the old world did we see the kind of apostasy and really the deterioration of the family that we see today. I personally don't believe that it is a coincidence that we've seen the complete breakdown of civilization, the family really starting at that moment when those grand revolutions were being pushed by classical liberals, my friend. Here we are. You can't blame the Catholic Church for the disaster we've created in modernity today. And you could tell me about the economic system. You could tell me about all your technology. But look at your families. They're being rotted out to the core. They're being destroyed by this current culture. Neil, as we wrap this one up, what are your final thoughts on the Alta Vendita? Well... I guess my final thoughts is people need to read it and understand it and spread it as much as possible. That needs to get out there because it's one of those documents that people kind of sort of know of, but like I said, write it off as some kind of conspiracy or not a big deal. This is a huge deal because this points out the tactics of the, like I said, this is the real screw tape letters. I mean, this is truly an elder demon speaking to his lesser demons saying, this is how we do it. This is how we get into the church and take it down. And you're never going to conquer the enemy if you don't know the enemy, if you're constantly blind to his tactics. And, well, I guess that's all I'm going to say. I was <laughs> going to add something, but I'm going to let it go. <laughs> I can go on and on. I'm just going to. It's just, well, well, I'll say this. When I read this thing, it got me so angry because I'm like, you sons of guns, look how clever you are and how well you've done it, and how effective you are. And then I look at my fellow Catholics, my brothers and sister Catholics, and I'm going, people, how do you, how do you not get riled up? You know, and like, ugh. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really one they've pulled really a grand trick on the entire world and again listen this is just the catholic example but i believe freemasonry and sort of the revolutions that ensued from that ideology in the late 18th century has encompassed the entire globe and every institution across the world i think it's an important document because for all the claims of conspiracy theory the fact is we have a document that was intercepted we have a document with the strategy. We have the playbook. We got Belichick's playbook in our hands, okay? <laughs> we got Belichick here. <laughs> it's, but, like, it's like uh, uh, if you ever watched the movie Patton, when he when he defeats um, Rommel's uh, tank division, he's yelling, I read your book. I read your book. <laughs> well, we got the damn book. <laughs> we got the book. Very well said, my friend. And I think this is... An issue that's never going to go away for us Catholics. I think, like you said, Neil, we have to highlight it, expose it for what it is, and really combat the ideas that it is some type of conspiracy. It's not a conspiracy. We're seeing this thing play out every day in the church and the rest of the world. 
So there you have it. Neil, I want to thank you for joining me again, my friend. Uh, this is Frank signing off for the Knights of Krishna. Good night, everybody.